Okay, so we'll get started. Um, welcome back from the two minute break. Um, and our next session is by uh, Deb Wingert from the Center for Educational Innovation and it's on classroom climate and mental health. Thank you, Thank you very much. Can you hear me okay? I hope. Good. Welcome. I wanted to speak with you for a few minutes about student well-being and course-related stress from a student perspective. And before we start, I wanted to do just a very brief think-pair-share with you. Um, you should all have a handout. Is that correct? Don't go through it yet. We'll go through it together. I promise. Oh, good. There's a couple of copies on the table. Thank you, Vrachita. I would like you to think about, for just, just a half a minute or so, I would like you to think about one factor or suggestion that has been reported by University of Minnesota students that increases course-related student well-being. Take 30 seconds, share with a partner, and we'll debrief in about one minute. Can I repeat? Oh, what I would like you to do is think for just 30 seconds about one factor or suggestion that has been made by UMN students that increases course-related student well-being. Can you hear me all right I'll back there? Okay, thank you. I'm going to explain all of this in a minute, but I wanted to check your knowledge base. About another 30 seconds. All right, bring that thought to an end and bring that sentence to an end. Does anybody have any ideas about what students had for suggestions regarding course related stress and how to experience student well being in their courses? Any ideas? Oh, thank you for the microphone. I, I appreciate that. Uh, black students and students of color stating that having black and fac black and people of color as faculty yes. and staff would Beautiful. greatly increase that. Thank you. Thank you. Well said. Anybody else? We talked about um, participation points okay. because they skew towards a certain type of pers personality. Uh -huh. And so students right away who aren't oriented yes. towards participating in groups can feel out of the game to begin with. Great. Great. Any other ideas before we go on? All right. I wanted to share with you um, a survey that was done um, and, and completed by University of Minnesota students regarding, regarding course-related stress and what helps to increase their well-being. And as we, I'll get into the survey and some of the details, the overall findings that we that we gleaned from this survey showed seven main themes. And those main themes are the themes that I'm going to share with you today, actually very briefly, because we've shared this before um, in a webinar. But the seven main themes were students saying that they liked clarity, clarity and organization, clarity of materials. I'll get into that a little bit more in a few minutes. And also an equitable workload where everything does not happen at the end of the semester, and also flexibility with office hours, with assignments, with assessments. Also, um, a, a fourth one that came up is approachability, where students felt that they could talk with the instructor about content issues and perhaps maybe about mental health concerns. Another big area was specific instructional strategies, and I'll share some of those also. 
also there were suggestions raised by students in this survey that talked about um, having um, exam preparation. They gave several suggestions in that area and also regarding grading policies. Here's my agenda for the next 45 minutes or so. I do want to do a brief re review of those seven themes and share with you how we did this survey, what our findings were, and what our recommendations are. But I'm only going to be doing a brief review of these seven themes because this is actually available on our CEI website. If you just go to CEI, dot umn dot edu and check under teaching resources you will find the webinar that is the same title of this particular session today so you can find out much more detail i actually want to save the rest of our time to go into what i call a deep dive into our data um, that was completed by students who shared identities relevant to their experience in courses, identifying as first generation students, dis students with disabilities, LGBTQ, um, underrepresented minor minorities, and international students. And I wanted to go into a deeper dive on that with you. I have some of the data in here. For the next several slides, I am going to explain and briefly review those seven common themes that came up in our survey. You will find um, those seven themes in narrative on pages two and three of your handout. And I encourage you, if you like, to take notes on this handy dandy front sheet, to take notes on the seven themes that I'm gonna be discussing briefly. And um, you can certainly raise questions on there too. So you're gonna be flipping around a little bit in this handout. But the next several slides I'm gonna be talking about are on pages two and three. Okay, so moving right along. People want to know, where did this survey come from? I want to tell you that there are many groups here throughout the university system who are working towards student um, well-being and have concerns about student mental health and want to increase student well-being. Two of those committees or councils collaborated together. One of the committees is called the, the fact, Faculty and Instructors Committee of the Provost Council on Student Mental Health. They were looking at, we are looking at, um, what can we do to help professors support student well-being? What can we do in the classroom to decrease stress and anxiety and increase student well-being? The other committee that we worked with is the Provost Advisory Committee on Teaching, Learning, and Technology, commonly referred to PACTILT. So the faculty, and PACTILT focuses on um, student mental health needs and what are the resources available and what resources do we need. So looking at those two committees, we put together a survey and disseminated the survey to all campuses last spring. Keep in mind, this is only a pilot survey, so we had just about 700 responses, and we're going to be seeing the data on about just about 650, 680 of those. So you will see on pages two and three some of your some of the findings that I'm going to go through now regarding those seven main themes and some of the basic demographics. First of all. Um, the undergrads, this, this shows the percentage of respondents throughout the campuses. Um, we had 83% undergrad. I don't want to read these to you because you can read them on your own and, and in your handout. But you can see that we had, you know, majority um, undergraduate students responding. Also, we had 10% graduate and 4.5 um, professional students. That would mean school of dentistry, vet med, pharmacy, med medical school, et cetera. And students also designated if they were in the first year, second year, third or fourth of their undergraduate or their graduate program. More um, demographics, you'll see this on pages two and three of your handout. 
Um, 73% of our respondents here from uh, the Twin Cities campus, 14% from the Rochester campus, 6% um, from Morris, um, smaller percent from Duluth, and Crookston, even though they were invited, the timing was not right for them. We did this in April and had a fast turnaround where we had um, respondents um, have a deadline sometime in mid-May, I think it was. So breakdown of our data of students, actually, we have 25 students identifying as first generation students, 23% identifying with a disability, one or more, and 13% identifying as LGBTQ with underrepresented URM minority, 12% international and returning uh, veterans. So that's some of the demographics that we have here. Now about the seven themes. Those you will find on pages two and three um, in the narrative form. And the first one you see there is clarity. And what students were talking about there is clarity of um, and organization of the overall course from assignments, um, clear in the syllabus, what are the assessments, um, a clear calendar of activities, what are the expectations, what is grading, clear communication, whether it is written or whether it is verbal. They wanted to have clear um, reminders, email, um, communication, that sort of thing. So that came across very strongly with the students. The clarity and organization helps to increase their student well-being. It decreases stress and anxiety. Theme number two was the actual behavior of the professor, the instructor. And that is, and we talked about that before, the approachability where students felt comfortable talking with um, the student, the student felt comfortable talking with the professor about issues, whether it's related to class or something that might be a concern um, that the student might have regarding mental health. Also a professor, um, instructor who accepts student feedback. A common thing that I do to glean student feedback early in the semester. I do this about every three or four weeks. I will disseminate just a small index card and to the students and have them fill out anonymously what is going well in the course and what is one suggestion for improvement. That is a form of formative evaluation. And I get feedback rather quickly about how I can tweak the course that will help to to increase student well-being and decrease the stress and anxiety. And I recommend that that is done every three to four weeks in class, very easy and easy to tabulate. Also a, a professor instructor um, who's caring, empathetic, um, checks in with the students. Every week I ask my students, how is your stress level? And I want to know, you know how they are doing. Do I need to tailor an assessment? Do I need to tailor an assignment? Do I need to make a more flexible deadline? That sort of thing. Um, they also like um, professors and instructors to be responsive to the knowledge about the course content and also have a knowledge base about student mental health concerns. Don't need to be a psychologist, don't need to be a psychiatrist, but to have some knowledge about um, student mental health and student mental health concerns. Be willing to provide extra help. Creating a supportive climate may mean making ground rules right in the classroom where um, students feel free to talk, they're free to make a mistake, they're free to ask a question, they're not um, afraid of being reprimanded or points taken away or grades going down because they made a, a particular comment. Creating a supportive climate and then also instructor behavior showing effective teaching, which I will get into in a bit more detail um, on one of the other themes here. Third theme, and then we're going to take a quick break. Third theme, they, this came across quite, um, quite often in our survey findings, that the students did not want busy work. They want helpful, meaningful assignments that mean something to them and something that they can use beyond the class. And then um, one that came up 
quite often was to have a balanced workload. And by that, an equitable workload, they're saying, please don't give us everything at the end of the semester or everything at midterm. Make things, you know, you do week three, week four, week five, that sort of thing throughout the entire semester. So if there's some way that that can be done. And those that are in a cohort, say they're in a dentistry cohort and they move with each other you know, through the courses or, or vet med or within a particular department, department they were recommending that um, the department faculty work together and try to make that equitable course load throughout their department, not just within the course, but also between courses. All right, I've talked for a good 10 minutes, so it's time for me to quiet down here and give you a chance. On your action plan, the first page of your handout packet here, I want you to describe and share with a colleague, and we'll only do this for like a minute or two, one of the following. We talked about the first three themes, clarity, instructor behavior, and equitable course load that really helps to um, increase student well-being. What is one thing that you might be able to do to help with that? Feel free to write that down on your front page and then share with a colleague. And I'll debrief in about one minute. It has come to my attention that many people here attending might be involved in student services. And I'm hoping that you might be able to generalize some of these tips that I was sharing and how you might be able to work with students in your particular area. And I know that might be a bit of a leap there. My apologies. So I'm hoping that that might help a little bit to um, think about these areas. So take another 30 seconds and we'll debrief. All right, bring that thought to an end. And bring that sentence to an end. Does anybody have any ideas that they would like to share with the group before we move on? You're probably getting ready for lunch. I'm going to move on. All right, um, the last couple of themes here. Seven themes came out, like I said, on this pilot survey. We hope to expand this survey, but we came up with some very interesting findings. Flexibility was the most frequently responded to theme that came up, talking about students wanting flexibility in attendance, that it would be okay to miss a class or two without having um, some type of drop in their grade or or some kind of reprimand of some sort. Homework deadlines, making convenient office hours. I usually have my office hours before and after class so students can come to class early or stay after class for a few minutes and they don't have to come to my office on the other campus, that sort of thing. Some also do their office hours by FaceTiming or Skype. There are many ways to do this, but convenient office hours, they were talking about flexibility.
flexibility in assignments, having makeup exams, exams and quizzes, many quizzes, not just um, one that, that determines their, their entire grade or most of their grade. Um, they wanted flexibility in course scheduling, not to cram everything in before the final or the midterm exam, but to take the time to go into those areas. And if there's an area they don't cover, do not put that in that particular exam. That was a pretty popular saying. So um, that was a huge theme of flexibility. One that I found most interesting was the, uh, were the suggestions regarding instructional strategies. And I found that many of the instructional strategies related to universal design for learning. Anybody familiar with that term? Okay. Pretty much te teaching and learning principles that allow everyone to learn well. Flexible assignments, flexible assessments, that sort of thing. And they were also talking about um, uh, multiple assessments, multiple assignments, multiple um, types of activities, not just standing behind the podium and speaking. You can read some of those there. Uh, and by the way, this is still on to pages two and three of your handout. We'll get to the other pages shortly. So that's, and they also mentioned aligned course design. Some students actually said aligned course design. And by that, they were referring to an objective that directly aligns with the assessment, that directly aligns with the learning activity that is teaching them and helping them to master that objective, lining those up. Many said that, it was lovely. More of the instructional strategies shared was to share constructive, timely feedback and to also scaffold large projects. And by that they meant don't assign something at the beginning of the semester and then just making it due at the end because people are working on it madly only at the end, but have something due week three, week four, week five. So when they come to the end, there's their project, they can hand in the entire thing, but it's been due throughout the semester in pieces, in chunks, it's been scaffolded. Also sharing relevant examples that are relevant to their life and something that they can use. And then to use Canvas or Moodle, we're moving to Canvas as you know, um, and use that effectively to record the lectures, have it very well organized, post information there, clearly organized and presented. So those were some of the main ones for instructional strategies. In terms of exam and exam preparation, that was one of our other themes that we found very popular with the students. They wanted study guides. They wanted um, um, and faculty instructors to go through the most difficult problems in class, the applications in class, and not on the test. They wanted the toughies in class so that when they come to that tough one um, on the final or, or the exam, the assessment, they know how to approach that. They wanted to have practice exams, sorry about that, um, review sessions during class, not outside of class or not in the evening, and then allowing students when they have an exam, it sounds like some were not able to go back to previous questions. So that was another one that would be um, helpful to them. And then the last theme had to do with grading and grading policies. They liked having um, assignments that became part of their final grade, many assignments that could add up to their final grade, and they could drop one assignment or one assessment, perhaps their lowest one, or perhaps one where they were not able to come to class for some reason, that sort of thing. They wanted course points distributed across multiple assignments, multiple assessments. Again, this is related, I believe the multiple assessments, et cetera, et cetera related to universal design for learning. They also wanted base grades to base their grades on competence and not on the bell curve. They did not want to be compared to their peers. They wanted to use points. They wanted to use contract grading. They wanted to use something that they could show their competence that was not related to how their peers did. So they gave many suggestions and, and all were saying no bell curve grading, no norm reference grading. And then finally, they, they wanted the policy observed, and many were not aware of this, and I think that 
Um, I work with many faculty instructors through CEI, and there may be some instructors that are also not aware that there is a policy that if a student has three or more exams in one calendar day, they can request that one be rescheduled. So that came up a couple of times that they would like to see that policy followed. So time for me to be quiet again. Those last four themes um, I have there in bright pink, would like you to choose one and share on your action plan sheet, think, pair, share, how you might use this in your area. How might this transfer in your area? One thing that you might do, and then we'll go into the diversity data deep dive after this. Ready? Take a minute. All right, bring that thought to an end. Bring that sentence to an end. Four themes to discuss. Does anyone want to share something that they might, that they have thought about or something that they might try at all in their particular setting? Okay, I gave it the five. Oh, good, we got oh. someone. Oh, I was going to the five second wait time and that goes to high critical thinking. If you weren't going there, I was going to move on. Go on. I just know from personal experience, I, a few years ago, I uh, went back to uh, try taking a physiology 3000 level course because it's the only one that fit my schedule that I did not have a science background. Yeah. And I found one, it was just, you know, it was kind of, Intimidating, but it, but um, uh, not having taken college level chemistry and being and jumping into doing a level a class that level, yes. I found the most helpful uh, piece uh, in the class that I took were the practice exams and the yes. availability, availability of yes. having those exams because uh, it helped me reframe how I was thinking exactly. about the material and I was able to do that on my own this without having wonderful to, and it was just the quickest thank fastest you. way to sort of practice modify. exams thank you so much very helpful anybody else would like to share okay we're going to go a little bit deeper now we're going to look at pages four five and six of your handout and I call this the survey diversity data deep dive we had about 13, 14 questions on our survey and on the data, the diversity data deep dive, question number five, we asked on a scale of one to 10, with one being not at all, five being moderate but manageable, and 10 being extreme, how much stress do you perceive in all aspects of your life? So stress, not just in your course, but throughout your entire life. You can see on in your PowerPoint, you should find it on pages, I think it was, where'd you find it? Page three, four? Yeah, page four at the bottom. Thank you. All surveyed, we have 651 that responded to this question. And overall, their stress from one to 10, okay, is 6.7, which is, you know, a little bit high. When we look at those identifying as first generation, disabilities, LGBTQ, URM underrepresented minority, um, you'll find higher scores, the significantly higher stress in all areas of their life. And then international, I found this across the board over again, that theirs was actually better. They really scored um, that they were handling their stress a little bit better. Not, not great, great, but a little bit better than the norm. 
So we were finding that those um, that we were looking at with the identities I just mentioned here were having a bit more difficulty in all aspects of their life. That was question five. I am now moving to question six, and I believe it's on the next page, page four. Page five, I'm sorry. And on, page, on question six, we asked, you know, on a scale of one to 10, what is the degree of your course related stress? And, and how does that, in, or how does course related stress impact your total stress levels? And looking at this again, we found with all of the students surveyed, the, of, of a 60, 651 who answered this survey, they still scored it a seven. So there, you know, there's moderate stress in their courses, things that we as instructors, faculty, instructional staff can do something about. But when you look at the first generation, disabilities, LGBTQ, and the underrepresented minorities, you'll find higher scores. And I bolded um, the disabilities because across the board, I found that they um, experienced the most stress. They expressed most stress uh, across the board, course related in all aspects of their life. Again, international scored um, better and, and so show that they were uh, managing it. They thought quite well. That was question number six. And the last one before we get to some of the open-ended data, we're on question seven of the diversity data deep dive. On a scale of one to 10, one being low, 10 being high, what degree are you managing your stress? Of those surveyed in our pilot survey, we found 651, they're at a five nine, okay? So kind of in the, kind of in the middle, moving up a little bit, kind of in the middle, uh, managing their stress. First generation disabilities, LGBTQ, and underrepresented minority, minority um, had more difficulty, you can see they have more difficulty managing their stress with disabilities, I bolded, had the most difficulty managing their stress. And again, international seemed to come out um, with the highest scores there of, of good stress management. So. We're looking at this deep dive, seeing that some of our students are really suffering in this area and there's things that we can do about this. So then I, I went into a little bit of a deeper dive with this and that is where you will find on page seven, on page seven, I just did an eye scan of some of the adaptive the healthy responses and some maladaptive responses. And so question eight referred to, what do you do to manage your stress or anxiety? And the main thing we found with adaptive, how they manage their stress and anxiety, most, and this is of all 651, okay? Um, to actually um, manage their stress, their overall stress, many used these wonderful ideas, time management. They would plan things out. They organized goals, had schedules. They took many breaks and um, did they, they would eat and sleep well. They would reward themselves as, after a chunk of study. This was really adaptive. We, we, um, we had several coders that came in and helped us with this data. And then we found another theme in the constructive adaptive area where they had time for relaxation where several went on and would do meditation. It should, I think that they said mediation there. I think it should say meditation, my apologies. Um, yoga, music, um, boxing, many things that would, you know, get them um, doing some exercise, um, movie time, time with friends, playing with pets. They had things, a brief nap, that sort of thing. We found these responses to be um, pretty constructive. Others were seeing a psychiatrist or a psychologist um, and also had a success coach. There was one name that kept coming up. I had to exit out um, because I have it in some of your data here. But there was someone um, on one of the campuses, I think is a success coach or a counselor, and the student said, I see this person all the time, and I want to identify this person. We already figured out who it was, and we want to contact the person and find out how we can replicate what this person is doing, because so many um, mentioned this person in such 
positive tone. So I won't share the person's name, but we're on to this person. <laughs> Question eight, some of the maladaptive responses, and that's where you'll see some of the open-ended responses on page seven. We'll get there in a minute. Some of the less constructive responses that we found were um, students were saying to manage their stress, they would use drugs, they would use chemicals, they were doing self-medication, whether it was alcohol or CBD, and I'm not going to get into the pros and the cons of CBD, they were self-medicating with that, which is what we were saying, you know, could be really harmful. We also saw a fair amount of compulsive behavior with eating, cleaning, shopping, and then a lot of people said that they would just go to sleep and avoid everything so that we made a whole category for that um, then looking at question nine this is pretty much the same that's why I'm blending this area here um, are there any specific things that you do to manage course related stress now we're narrowing it down and with this we found pretty much the same responses that I just went through so I'm not going to read those again the adaptive constructive responses You'll see that on your PowerPoint, pages five and six, I believe, five at least. And then also with the course-related stress, some went to the maladaptive responses that I already shared. So with that, I want you to go to page seven in your handout, and you will see um, I started to cut and paste. This is eye scanning only the maladaptive responses responses to question eight and you can see some of the things that they said that they how they were handling their overall stress and this um, is the responses that i found even though it represents the 651 um, that responded to questions eight and nine at least 95% of the responses came from the identities that I shared with you earlier, and 95% of those were with those that um, labeled, um, or identified, I'm sorry, identified um, with some sort of disability. So these responses, I want you to take a look at, you'll see these on question eight, and you'll see these all the way over to page 10, I believe. On questions eight and nine, you'll see several of the maladaptive responses. To me, what I counted was just eyeballing this. Of 651 students, I was seeing eight to 16% of our responses were in this maladaptive um, range. And when you read some of these, to me, they were heartbreaking. And I want us to look at my final question here, uh, and, and the thing that I really wanted us to get to most of all and spend a good five minutes on this, you know, what are your thoughts about these responses? What are existing resources in your, on your campus to support student well-being? And what are the resources needing? That's what our groups meet for, the provost council and the committees. We're all looking at what we can do to better this. So that's my nutshell question to you. And you can certainly take notes on your handy dandy cover sheet. I left one row at the bottom to go through sharing your thoughts, existing resources and resources needed. So are there any questions? Deb, there's an online. Yes. There's an online question. Oh, can you share that, please? Absolutely. Um, can you. you review what the definition is of an underrepresented minority? I believe that the student, you know what, they, there was not a definition on this survey. And we had them identify themselves at an underrepresented uh, minority. Um, and in, uh, there was also a slash with that that said ethnicity. So um, those that identified, I don't know the specific information. We did have an other column, and that's where we had students identify as um, a parent, um, a veteran, a returning student, a rape survivor, that sort of thing. But in terms of the URM, um, we did not specifically um, designate um, give any examples there, at least to my understanding, and I did not see any with that. I'm sorry that I don't have any more clear data on answering that question. Again, this was a pilot survey, and very likely we need to make that more clear in our 
follow-up survey, hopefully um, soon. I know that you mentioned there were more resources on the CEI website, so I'm looking forward to looking into those. Please. Um, but do you happen to have um, kind of these overview data points for the diversity data deep dive that you described here um, that cover students who self-reported um, holding multiple identities? Um, so when we're looking at those slides that show the end of the responses, yes. are students counted yes. in multiple buckets? Are there yes. um, places when, where they good intersect? Good question. Good question. And that's probably not on the CEI site yet. But we did have this completed. We put all of the findings into an Excel sheet, and we are able to see many did identify with more than one identity, and that can be looked at through Excel, although it has not been done yet. And the reason that it hasn't been done yet is that the committee members are graduate students and faculty and instructional staff, and I believe that there's a time factor involved that they might not be able to get to all of that, but I do believe that that is of interest and they do want to break that down. So we hope to get that. And like I said, this was a pilot survey. These are preliminary findings and we want to expand this because this was only 700 students throughout the entire system. Okay, take five minutes, take a look at these and see if you can um, maybe uh, have a few uh, points regarding these talking points here, these questions, and I'll check you in five minutes and we'll wrap up. A lot of people are already wrapping this up, so let's wrap this up. Might be ready for lunch. <laughs> um, would anyone care to share their thoughts at all? What was maybe addressed at their table? Hi there. Um, I guess uh, just the larger context that I mentioned at my table is that um, uh, both my colleague Malik and myself have been uh, in a couple of different things this week that have been spurning this conversation of what can we do to improve climate um, and have been a part of committees that are talking about how to improve climate, specifically around sexual misconduct and gender, yes. um, since we both work at the Aurora Center here at the Twin yes. Cities campus. Um, but continually, I just come back to the idea that, um, you know, I, I, so I did my undergrad in engineering. Um, yes. I certainly can think of probably at least two courses in my freshman year that I could have just wiped out and still been a successful engineering student. Yes. Um, and I imagine what would it look like because yes, there's resources that are needed to support students when their coping mechanisms fail, when the stressors are really high. Yes. But what are we doing to actually teach them how to manage stress? How do you healthily exactly. cope? All those things. Like what would it look like if our if we had a universal requirement at this university mm -hmm. for students to not only have conversations about health and well being, yes. but about race, about gender, about class, about all these different things. Yes. If we're talking about um, Dr. Esther Chu yesterday, I think Rebecca was referring to that talk at the Times of Healthcare thing, um, talked about this idea that improving diversity in any organization not only improves the financial well-being of that organization, it proves outcomes for Lovely. patients, it improves um, intellectual like yes. richness, you know, all those things. It has it's, a wonderful I domino. Mean, I mean, yeah. what, what academic department wouldn't want to see their students doing higher uh, yes. in terms of GPA, all that kind of stuff, that performance, right? Because we're talking you. about retention and, and recruitment, yes. um, right? If, if a student knows that, hey, I'm going to, like, for example, for me in engineering, I know one of the things, I don't know if schools still do this, but we looked at the fundamentals of an engineering exam is the pre-licensing exam for engineers in multiple disciplines. Mm -hmm. um, a lot of students will look at the pass rate for first-time takers at their engineering school. Mm -hmm. um, the engineering school I was a part of had a pretty high one. It was mm -hmm. above like 89 or 90%, right? But if you can improve those things just by simply changing some of the climate and well-being. Exactly, right? exactly. I, I think, but Thank again, you. we're not instructors, um, mm -hmm. right? So like thinking about that sphere of influence, I think some of that is is the exactly. argument that I mean, I mean, I'm sure you all probably agree. Thank you so much. Thank you for sharing. Up. I am yeah. going to, I, you do have an index card that was just passed out at your tables. And I'm going to ask you a question to write down. I, I feel free to share your thoughts on that card. We will be compiling those and looking into those. So anybody else to share thoughts or resources or resources needed? Anybody else? We talked about um, starting early with some so, sort of social media discussion uh -huh. about how do you manage um, school yes. and not get yes. sucked into a lot of the social media yes. stuff. Yes, a lot of that can become toxic. 
I'll just share one other thing that relates very much to Paul's comment. Um, so I, I hope that some of you know, many of you know that the uh, uh, liberal arts curriculum or liberal ed curriculum is being considered right now. And it, that curriculum is the domain of the faculty. But, but there are two options in front of the faculty. One of those options would not require that students take any course in diversity and equity in the United States context. And then the other one does require that. There's a comment, a way to comment on those, those um, options online. And I would encourage everybody to do that because frankly, whether you're faculty or not, what our students have uh, to engage with in the classroom will matter to their holistic experience while they're here. So I'd encourage you to take a look at that. Thank you. Can that link get sent out with the slides and things too? Yeah. yeah. Just um, as a faculty member who was on the LERC committee for two years and seeing this um, proposals come forth now, I also want you to know if you haven't attended the forums yet that none of these proposals were unanimously supported by the faculty. Um, and there are considerable um, disagreement around the question that Rebecca raised. And I think one of the best forums I've been to thus far was the one um, where advisors um, commented on the nature of um, the curriculum as it is being put forth now. Um, and it was so substantive because of the way in which advisors interact with students on a day-to-day -day basis. Um, and wait, while all of you may not be advisors, you often are in positions where you interact with students and a number of students in a number of different capacities. So putting your thoughts on the forum would be greatly appreciated. Thank you. Any other comments, thoughts, existing resources, resources needed? Please. Thank you. So I see a lot of um, asks on the part of the student, and I'm wondering what we can put in place to kind of put some accountability measures around faculty because they are deciding the curriculum, right? And how do we get all faculty to recognize that these things are important and valuable to the success of students as well, if they're the ones making big decisions about what students are doing and how they have access to this information and what they place value on. Um, and then a part of the accountability measures, making that very difficult to skirt around. Because I know I went to an institution that had like diversity and inclusion courses and things that you can get for that credit, but then students can take a yoga class and that would count for diversity and inclusion, okay. right? Which I think is important for wellness. Like, what? it's a great thing to have. Mm -hmm. um, but then we know that there are students who place different yeah. values on different topics and yeah. it's easy for them to get around certain topics. So making that not a yes. possibility as well. Thank you. Thank you for sharing. Anybody else? We're going to wrap up here, please. So when I was in MSA last year, I was a student senator, and we talked about this, which is, um, is anyone from Office and Equity and Diversity today? All right, so there is a certificate program that I'm also in there too, and I think it's a great resource to do so, but I'm just wondering, and students are also wondering, why is this not required when university is talking about diversity and inclusion, and this are not required when any new faculties are coming in, but students are, I just did a um, upcoming new equity and diversity inclusion um, program that I have to go through all this question and whether I know or not about the equity and diversity, but I need to know why these are not required for the, any faculty or staff who's are coming in. These are optional. So it is questionable as a student perspective, if these are not a requirement, it is just wondering, like, are they really thinking about equity and diversity as a student perspective? So that will be my comment. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Um, this question has come up about whether they should be required or not. And I think um, our education um, department within OED has reflected on it. And apparently, the research shows there's mixed results of mandating versus inviting and so that is one reason but at the same time i do recognize that uh, with the sexual misconduct work the mandatory training was where the direction went and that was a 
you know, concerted effort and it had impact and it showed, um, you know, the commitment, it certainly rallied a lot more people. So I, I think there's both sides to that. Um, I do know that we get about 3,000 people, I think, every year going through this, uh, but predominantly there's staff with some faculty and a few students. So I think um, that's what needs to change. So again, bringing it back to faculty and student groups would be uh, an important thing. Thank you. All right, I think we'll wrap this up. Thank you, Varachit. I really much appreciate it. Um, next steps, I believe this final uh, few minutes here, two minutes, um, you'll find on page six. We, like I said, this was only a pilot um, survey. We really want to expand this. So our next steps are to look at this and to take a look at, you know, the themes that are so um, closely related to UDL, Universal Design for Learning. We want to look into that deeper. And then we want to use this to help increase student well-being and to further develop faculty instructor development um, sessions to help faculty use um, some of the um, strengths and findings that we have found with this survey and how we can help students increase their well-being. So with that, um, I'm going to wrap this up. You have an index card. <laughs> I would love to hear what you found is perhaps one thing you can take from this session and one suggestion perhaps for improvement. Or if you have a question, feel free to put down your email. We can contact you. All right, and you can just leave those upside down and my grandson who was four is here, we'll come around and pick them up. Yeah. His name is Julian, he goes by the name Penguin and he's been very busy here with a wonderful group over here. So we'll come around and pick them up in a few minutes. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you all. Um, so with that, if you could take that minute to fill out the index card, we will then transition to lunch and we'll, we will regroup. Uh, lunch is just here over to the right and to online participants, lunch is on your own. <laughs> um, and or you can join us if you're on campus. Um, and um, we will regroup at 1230 um, and start the next session. Thank you.